one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. Her name is Jira Lind Kolarik. She is the author of three books. The book we'll be discussing tonight is Freed to Kill, the true story of serial murderer Larry Eiler, uh, a series of serial murders that took place in the Midwest. She is also the author of Prisoners of Fear and I Am Cain. But uh, tonight we're going to just talk uh, about a pretty gruesome series of deaths that took place in the Midwest. So it's probably a good idea not to have this uh, audio be heard by uh, you know any sensitive type viewers. But uh, Geraldine, are you there? Yes, I am. Awesome. Thank you for agreeing to the interview. Of people who don't know of your name, could you talk a little bit about your background and how you became interested or involved really in this subject? Um, my background is in television news. I was a reporter, a police reporter in Chicago, uh, and I started in the 1970s. And then I went to uh, WBBM TV, and I was the overnight assignment editor and chief criminal person when involved uh, police stories. And then I went to WLS ABC in Chicago. And while being an assignment editor on the desk, uh, you know, you make beat checks as reporters on finding out cases, and I saw an unusual pattern that I felt was beginning in uh, some of the outer counties in Illinois, uh, Kankakee counties, a body of a young boy that was found uh, in a field, stabbed multiple times, 30 times, and without any identification. And then uh, what was happening was that in Lake County, Illinois, like about 100 miles away, we were starting to find some bodies of men that were found without identification. Uh, the pants pulled down and multiple stab wounds. And of course the police thought maybe they were drug related murders and uh, people were dragged across the field and nobody wanted to identify them. And then uh, Indiana started coming up with some bodies of men that were found without identification, multiple stab wounds uh, in wooded areas. Uh, so you didn't know you know, how long they were there, and uh, I had a coroner friend in Indiana contact me on a beat check and saying, can you help us in doing uh, some type of uh, ID by having your court artist do some sketches on some three of our victims? We think that maybe they're from Chicago, and uh, we feel that maybe they may be gay, gay men, and uh, male prostitutes, and that's how I figured we had a homosexual serial killer. We did do some artist drawings, but at that time, W. Ellis didn't want to run the story nor the artist drawings, so our gay newspaper in Chicago ran the uh, artist pictures, and guess what? A week later, everybody was identified. All three men were identified, and they were male prostitutes. Gotcha. And so now- I felt that we had a serial killer. And that was roughly 1982, is that correct? Yep, 1982. And then uh, 1983, on September 17th, a young boy uh, was found dead in Lake County, Illinois, right by Great America. Again, we have uh, pants pulled down and multiple stab wounds, but this time there was a driver's license found in the blood, and there was also a footprint that was found in uh, in the dirt because it was just rained the day before in tire tracks. So now they had a very fresh scene because they were doing construction in the area and the contractors came the next day and found the body. So uh, we, it was started to become very apparent and um, I learned that Indiana was looking for a possible homosexual serial killer because they had as many as nine bodies. Wow. Illinois had four. But the bodies, uh, like in the different jurisdictions, it seemed like whoever was uh, committing the crimes had started moving from one jurisdiction to another. Do you, is that correct? Absolutely, gotcha. absolutely. The MO was uh, taking them and uh, out into a rural area and then doing whatever they had to do with them sexually, and then uh, they would... Uh, stab them multiple times, at least 30 times or more, and leave them to decompose out out in, out in the woods. And, uh, you know, they just leave them out there, and the animals would take care of the rest. 
and I think that uh, the person felt that too many bodies were accumulating in Indiana. That's why they moved more to Illinois, and that's why Lake County near Wisconsin were getting more of the bodies. And um, there was very sadistic too, right? There were stab wounds were very deep. I think that one of the medical examiners said there was a hunting knife that had to have been eight inches in length, and some of the stabs were all the way to the hilt, right? Absolutely, they're eviscerated. Eviscerated means that you are cut into pieces inside, like you would put the knife inside and then pull up, and you would rip up all the organs, and you would cause the body body parts literally to just ooze out. So they were very vicious stab wounds. It wasn't like just a puncture wound. These were very vicious, cruel attacks. Right, and uh, they were finding on some of the um, uh, the bodies, or if not most of them, that the wrists had had evidence that they were handcuffed too. Correct. Right, and some type of ligature. Ligature. Mostly right. it was handcuffs, and one of the hands in uh, Lake County was cut off. And eventually, we learned that uh, on the victim, Ralph Ferreira, the uh, idea is that uh, he could not find the handcuff key, so he had to cut off the hand. I see. To cut off the hand, so, the, the perpetrator to cut off the hand to get the the cuffs off, correct? To get the hand, you get to get the handcuffs off, correct. Right. Gotcha. So, and we had as many as 25 bodies. Um, because of the Ralph Khalees murder, uh, I was very much aware that there was a task force in Indiana. And I told the sheriff in Lake County, uh, William Babcock at that time, that there was a task force. I was looking at their murders in Indiana, and I said, I think it's a serial killer, and I gave him the name of Frank Love, who was head of the task force, suggested that they call him, and the sheriff said to me, you stick with covering the news, and I'll stick with being a cop. And he called me that night, and he said, Agatha Christie, you have one heck of a story. We're meeting with the task force the next day. And that's when we wrote the story at Channel 7. Gotcha. And you said, I think you read at one time, you were the only person who realized at one time that the bodies are linked to the bodies found in Indiana. So, yeah, so that so that's kind of your direct tie to this serial murder. Right, because as a news person, I, you know, I save all my notes whenever there was a body found, and I put them in a folder called Unidentified Bodies, and uh, I saw the similarities. It was a stab wound. I'll be honest, William. It was a stab wound that made me think this is a crime of passion of some kind, not your typical drug-related murder. Right, and there were some comparisons. I think the police were comparing this series of death to John Wayne Gacy, who was also from Chicago, the Chicago area, and the Atlanta child murders, just in uh, the kind of total number of victims. Um, not too much in that, because the M.O. was completely different. Gotcha. Uh, and with Gacy... All the bodies were buried underneath the house. Uh, the Atlanta children murders, that is true, because I remember sending our reporter out to Atlanta uh, concerning this and uh, trying to see if there was any kind of link with that. And then um, how did it progress? I mean, what uh, were the next steps and how the police investigation and your investigation kind of continued to unfold what was happening? Well, right after the task force meeting, incredible as it was, there was a, a traffic stop in Indiana, like a week to two weeks after, where a trooper saw a man leaving a pickup truck going into a ditch with a young boy, and he ran the license, and he saw that the man was a suspect uh, in a number of serial killings because Larry Zeiler's name was given out uh, by a task given to the task force as a possible suspect and uh, because he was involved in S&M and other situations in a previous crime uh, 10 years earlier where a man survived a very vicious stabbing. And that was Mark and, Hen- Mark uh, Henry, right? You, that's how you start your book. Right. Well, yeah, right. But it was I changed the name of the guy. Okay. I called him Mark Henry. Right. And... Um, they, he, he saw that he was a possible suspect, so he went down into the ditch, the police officer, and brought Eiler and the young boy out of there. And uh, he handcuffed Larry Eiler, and he put him in his squad car, 
and for the task force, and many had the tow trucks uh, uh, towed back to the police station. And then while well, at the police station, they searched the vehicle, and they found a knife there that appeared to have blood on it, and they found boots that uh, apparently had blood on it because at the crime scene of Ralph Khalif, the police let them know that they found tire tracks and they found boot prints. So what happened was that now they had what they felt was physical evidence from the task force because Lake County two weeks earlier met with the task force and told them what evidence they had. So they felt that they had a serial killer. And uh, they called the task force, and they let the young boy go after the young boy told them uh, he offered me uh, $100 if I would have S&M sex with him and he allowed me to tie him up. But this young boy was going to be perhaps the next victim of Larry Eiler. Gotcha. And, uh, and the, there uh, was that's, a... like, that's what happened. And there was kind of a type of all these victims that were associated with Eiler, correct? They were all around 18 to 26 or something? Yeah, they were young men. They were young men, mostly. I'd say mostly in their 20s. These college were college-aged college age men. Right, yeah, college-aged men, uh, male prostitutes or gay men. And um, they, were, uh, they were the victims of Larry Eiler, but mostly of them were prostitutes. Yeah. Gotcha. And they he pick up. Right, and so he, I mean, when they found out and kind of studied Eiler, they found he was driving, he was very... He was never in one place at any time. He seemed to be driving around or kind of on the freeways or highways. Is that correct? Well, what was strange with Larry Eiler is that he would uh, be a normal-looking young man, uh, blue jeans, shirt, everything. And then when he would get into that mood to go out looking for a victim, he would change into a red T-shirt that said U.S. Marines. And he would have a cap on, a army fatigue type of hat, on, uh, and boots and tight jeans, and he would go out there and look like hunting for his victims. Right, and he and had he con- would go up and down the streets of Chicago in the gay area, as well as the lakefront, looking for his victims or bus stops, like he did in Indiana. And I think in your book you talk about the police tailing him like ex- uh, extensively. And just watching him drive around, looking at young men, driving down, going to different gay bars, and just kind of like in a hunter, hunter stance, like you said. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. He was looking at his prey, looking for his prey. But Larry was mostly motivated in what he did by when he would have a fight with his lover, John. Gotcha. And nope. then his, he had a lover, and his lover was a very handsome man. And would often cheat on him. And that would get him very enraged. And that's when it seems that he would go out on his hunt. And who was he living with? Was that John Little? Was that his name? Was that the No, uh, okay, that was this different. is John Debrabowski in okay. Chicago. Gotcha. And John had a wife too, Sally. And also they had a son together. So it was a kind of an unusual triangle there. Uh, who was very good friends with a professor from Indiana State, Dr. Robert Little. And they were very good friends, and Dr. Little seemed to appear quite often around the time afterwards or before uh, some, of, some of Larry Eiler's uh, killings. Yeah, yeah, there was a strange connection between them. And uh, so... <clears throat> There were other deaths too that kind of led up that they that he was he was a, a potential suspect even before the car was pulled over in Indiana, right? That is right. He was a suspect in twenty five murders. Right, so it's a lot. He was a suspect in twenty five murders, and there were some other bodies found in Ohio that they think that perhaps he was involved in. We also believe that he didn't act alone. Um, they were trying to track down leads that he was part of a an S and M ring in a snuff film ring, in which uh, it would be there would be a video, a, a movie would be made of actual killings, and there was a barn found in Lowell, Indiana, where we found a mass grave of four victims, 
someone, and I remember going into that barn with the police and looking, and there were nails up there, like you would have put in lights, and that really scared me. It was really unusual. No electricity in there, huh. but it looked like somebody could have been doing some type of video inside that barn. And you, that was when you kind of helicoptered in when they, when the police were also kind of taking a look at that barn, barn correct? Uh, yep, right. yep. And uh, we also contacted, we contacted a local affiliate up in that area, and sure enough, they had the video of that. And that's how we broke with our story, too, because I would save some of the video from other affiliates uh, up in Indiana whenever there was a body. I heard about a body and thinking that it may be a link. So I had three or four videotapes. Uh, back then, it was the big three-quarter inch tapes. Right in my locker at Channel 7. But when we were ready to break with the Eiler story, we had enough stuff to go with. Gotcha. So after... And Eiler even did an interview with us. He even did an interview with us. Oh, interesting. After the pickup truck was stopped. Yeah, and uh, he did a silhouette interview with Jay Levine. <coughs> How did that progress? Based, uh, that he saying that he was a victim, he okay. was a victim, and that the police violated his rights, and that they just picked on him because he was a gay man. Gotcha. So it was the gay man excuse. So, but there was, I mean, after he was pulled over by the police, it started this kind of legal um, wrangling that ended up uh, not making the state and the police officers look good. Correct. That is correct, Larry Eiler. After they found the knife and they found the boot, um, uh, Detective Dan Collin from Lake County, Illinois, uh, brought the boot with others to Washington, D.C., the FBI lab, and they carried it with them, and they were able to match the blood of Ralph Calise inside the boot and inside the, uh, the knife, too, on the knife, and they were able to connect... Uh, Larry Eiler to the death of Ralph Calise, and they charged him with that murder. But uh, Dave Shippers, who was his attorney, was very, very smart criminal defense attorney, and he showed that Larry Eiler's rights were violated, and his rights were violated. If they would have told him that you are a suspect in a bunch of serial killers, would you be able to come down to the station and want to talk to you? Eiler probably would have and would have signed papers allowing them to search his vehicle, which he eventually did. But the minute they handcuffed Larry Eiler, <coughs> excuse me, they violated his rights because they didn't have any any evidence right. to arrest him. And uh, therefore, it was called fruit of the poisonous tree. Right. Once a wrong act was done by the police and handcuffing him, bringing him to the station, putting him in a cell for the task force, that all the evidence and everything that followed could not be used against him. Right. So, and that's how we got the name of the book, "Free to Kill." Free to Kill. So it was David Chippers was also involved in the Star Report, right? Wasn't he hired by Ken Starr later yeah. to come yes. to DC? So yes. he was, uh, you yes. know, uh, kind of a legal star. But yeah, they. I think there was a uh, inappropriate arrest. Not it wasn't properly done procedurally. So then. Much of that stuff, when as the as the kind of court as the case case progressed in court, can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, as the case once they charged Larry Eiler, they had hearings concerning his arrest, and uh, they they deemed that the evidence cannot be used against him because it was illegally obtained by the police once they violated his constitutional rights. And arresting him, even though they got his permission to search the pickup truck, mm. and they they asked the other uh, counties for any evidence to come forward so that they could charge Larry. But you got to remember these small collar counties; they have a very limited budget, and to extradite him from Illinois on circumstantial evidence, like they had on Stephen Agan. Stephen Agan was a victim. A uh, suspected victim of Larry Eiler, the young boy that was picked up at a bus station and then uh, brutally stabbed and left out in the forest area. But what happened was that they found a cigarette lighter and a key. And the key 
was a key that was missing to an office where Larry Eiler worked. So that was Larry Eiler's key. And they could not, you know, that was circumstantial, the fact that Larry Eiler's key was found near the scene of the victim. Gotcha. And that's what they were going to use to try to have him charged with Stephen Agin murder. But a limited budget, they felt they had circumstantial evidence. They did not press charges. So that's why out of 25 murders, nobody had sufficient evidence to really link Larry Eiler to any of the murders except the Ross Calise murder, and that evidence was suppressed. Suppressed, right. So what, after the suppression, uh, the, the judge just... Uh, you know, ended the case, right? Was it blue? Yep, yeah. the case, it was it. It was out. Yep. And uh, two years later, a young boy named Danny Bridges, who was a male prostitute, was found cut up in uh, four major pieces in garbage bags behind 1625 West Sherwin in Chicago. And uh, the person seen bringing the bags out was Larry Eiler. Eiler again. So the young boy was... Uh, Eiler was charged because the police came into the apartment, did some testing for blood, and found blood all over the bathroom, all over the place, through a procedure called luminol. Mm -hmm. And Larry Eiler was charged with the murder of Danny Bridges. And uh, he was charged, and he was sentenced uh, sentenced to death. And one of the oddities is after his, after the case was thrown out and before the murder of Danny Bridges, uh, Eiler was hanging around with shippers, right? Like they were, he was doing work for them at his office or something like that. So you yep. had, had this kind of guy yep. who was associated with unknown numbers mm -hmm. of victims. Like they know, they think that it's what, 25, but it could be more, right? Well, they believe that in that apartment on Sherwin, he killed another boy by the name of Cowboy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was another body that was taken in it's somewhere in a landfill yet to ever to be found, uh, cut up. And so that's how he was going to get rid of Danny Bridges, was also put him in garbage bags, put him in a dumpster. The garbage men were supposed to come that day, and then it would go into a landfill, and nobody would have known about the murder of Danny Bridges. He just would have been a male prostitute missing. But then they, they uncovered it, and they charged him with that. And what was happening was that I, I went to the trial, and I was writing free to kill and then when the book came out uh larry eiler's attorney kathleen zellner contacted me because she was working on his appeal off a of death row because uh, she was very interested in the book and the fact that i had this evidence against eiler with this key and cigarette lighter in indiana and she said that eiler would be willing to confess to some of the murders hmm. if uh uh, confess to some of the murders if I felt also too would cooperate with her because she said that Larry Eiler didn't act alone and he named the professor from Indiana State University helping him with the uh, murder of Stephen Agin and uh, an unknown Chicago author with Chicago View Press all of a sudden I became a national author overnight my first book because Newsweek Time and everybody came in there looking at what the stories were uh, and how the book opened up all these cases. Gotcha, yeah. It's really a great book. I highly recommend it. And for people who don't know, Kathleen Zellner is now associated with Stephen Avery as his attorney, his appellate attorney. I don't know, I haven't followed what's going on at this present time, but I know that you know there were appeals filed, etc. Well, she's a good lawyer. She's a good lawyer. And she's a real bulldog, I'll tell you that, getting involved in the cases on this. And uh, when Larry Eiler died in 1995, <clears throat> I called forth Kathleen Zellner to release all information on all the murders uh, that, and to clear it for the families. Because the originally, uh, when I started writing the book, a lot of the families wanted to know the truth of what happened to their sons. Mm -hmm. um, one, a lot of them did not believe that their sons were gay, and it really bothered them. And they wanted to know the truth, how their sons got picked up, where they male prostitutes, and they wanted it for their own conscience. And I felt that I had to help them out to learn the truth. 
So that's what Larry Eiler died of AIDS in 1995 in jail uh, in Statesville in, in uh, southern Illinois. And the when- owner came forth and had a news conference and released all the details, highlighting the fact that the book helped solve all them, you know, opened up all these cases. Oh, fascinating. Well, that's great. So when was he scheduled for execution? Do you remember? Did he have an execution date when he was dying? No, he did not have an execution date. There was all these appeals that were going on gotcha. at the time. And uh, Kathleen Zellner wanted to prove that uh, this professor from Indiana State University was also involved in the Danny Bridges murder. That's why Eiler uh, confessed to the Stephen Agin murder, and we had this big trial in Indiana and where he brought this a professor was arrested, brought in. It was a jury trial, but the jury didn't want to believe the words of a serial killer on death row. And they found that there wasn't enough evidence to convict Dr. Little. Dr. Little, right. So, and so he was set free, and Eiler went back to death row. Gotcha. But there was also was there wasn't there another unidentified accomplice who Eiler never said anything about? Is that true? Other than Little? Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep, there's another accomplice, alleged accomplice out there, and I never learned the name of the accomplice at all. Gotcha. But uh Kathleen Zellner tried to try to get as much evidence as she could. They raided uh lockers, uh lockups where Doctor Little had a lot of his stuff and they raided his house and everything the police did looking for evidence. What I was really scared on is that police notified me that Dr. Little had a complete file on me. Oh, wow. And uh, every single clipping, anything I did on television in the end that he had recorded and all this stuff on me. And there was a man that escaped from jail when Dr. Little was uh, in jail. And I was notified by Kathleen Zellner that this man was paid to kill her and me and oh, uh, that was that was really strange and uh, I had Chicago police at my house and everything and after a week I said you know forget it you guys go home you're not going to sit here in my lobby I'm not afraid let, let a serial killer come and get me that's oh. okay it's between them and me <laughs> wow yeah I mean you were in the thick of it for a long time how did Zellner get involved in the case uh, Zellner took it as a pro bono, pro bono uh, to help him get off the death row. Gotcha. But she's she's from, she's from Michigan or something, right? Isn't she from Michigan? I think she was from Indiana. Indiana. Originally. Oh, okay. okay. And uh, she's a well-to-do lawyer. Well-to-do lawyer. Uh, uh, her husband is uh, one of the heads of a major bank here in Chicago, and she uh, just was a lawyer that loves to help people and try to help innocent people to have get their say out there and to get off of whatever crimes that they may be innocent of that they've been accused of. Gotcha. So she's a good lawyer. She's a good lawyer. Did they ever do an analysis of Eiler and ascertain why he was so violent or what his, what his um, you know, other than sexual motivation, what his motivation for the brutality was? Yes. Yes, they did. Uh, Larry Eiler well, had a foster father. And one of the things as the foster father, when he would discipline Larry, uh, he would put him, he would tie him up and put him in a bathtub and pour hot water from the faucet onto his genitals. And that would enrage Larry and being tied up would enrage him. And um, he would get angry. And when he would get very angry, he would live out his fantasies of taking people in putting them in place of the person that he's angry about. And he would replace these male prostitutes with John, and then he would be angry that they would perform a sexual act on him and that he, that they made him cheat on his lover. And that's when he would stab him multiple times because of his rage at John. Wow. So that's that was, he, was, he was a borderline personality. He was also schizophrenia. So, and uh, let's see, let's see, schizophrenic and bipolar and borderline personality. Yeah, so he was just a mess. So, but his lover also died of AIDS too, correct? It's kind of right. His lover crisis. died of AIDS first, and he infected Larry, and then that's gotcha. that's how Larry got, and that's how Larry died. Gotcha. 
And uh, well, is there anything else to this story that you know we missed or that you'd like to uh, make a comment about? Well, I think that the I, I don't think that Larry acted alone, seriously. And we never knew whatever happened with Dr. Little. After all the stuff hit the fan about 92, 93, uh, with the Stephen Agin case and the trial, he seemed to have disappeared from Indiana State University and Terre Haute. And where did he go? What's happening? You know, that's my good question. And the fact that you still have similar cases that's scary right. uh, out there uh, I mean I was when Dahmer happened I was contacted by the Milwaukee police and I was brought down to Milwaukee to look at victims photos and see if there was any connection with Dahmer with Eiler and I said no not at all that I knew of because and I hate to say it he had my book free to kill in his apartment really and wow that's the, scary he had the page marked and they showed me where he where i talked about the fact that he used placidil sleeping pill right. and he put two to three placidils in a beer and he would shake it up and then put the beer in a cooler and then when he'd get a victim he'd offer him a beer and he'd pop it open for them but of course he already had it drugged and then his victims would fall asleep and then he would fantasize in his mind what he was going to do with them and then he'd wake up, maybe two hours later, he'd wake them up. And this is what Dahmer did. He would drug his he would drug his victims. And that scared me as a writer never to be very descriptive again in describing how to drug somebody to kill well, them. Well, it's interesting because oftentimes in the research into Dahmer, they will not explain what he was using. They just say sleeping pills, you know. They don't specify the specific pill. Yeah, it's interesting. It was Placidil. 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 Right, right. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, it's pretty remarkable. These guys are similar, and I think a lot of what I've researched into the Smiley Face Killers, a lot of them were being drugged with GHB or something else. You know, some other, these homosexual motivated criminals have very similar. Well, you know what? Animals. What was good with Free to Kill is that it really opened the eyes how police would not think of men as victims of serial killers. That's what the whole big issue was. Yeah, okay. Men would not be considered victims. Uh, right. If you had 25 women missing, it would be front page. Right. And if you had a man suspected of killing 25 women, brutally stabbed, sexually molested, I mean, you would never have only three people when he's, when he's free. You'd have a big uproar. And right. this really opened it up. When it, it came out in 1990, 92, Avon Books acquired the rights and came out with 500,000 books. Wow. It went into 10 printings, wow. uh, sold in France, sold over Europe. And now, I tell you, it, 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 it hasn't stopped because now it's on e-books and audio books on right. Amazon. And uh, last month alone, we had 300 copies of Free to Kill sold. Wow. And how many years? It's 30 years now. Right. And we're seeing 15, 30 on e-books and the audiobooks, the new world out there. So it's it's like it's never stopped because people are interested in uh, serial killers. Well, yeah, but this case is very relevant. You know, it's uh, these. I, I do believe that there is a couple of homosexual motivated killers out there, and uh, you know, I think that the Eiler case is actually one that I came across in my research, uh, similar to Dahmer. And uh, so I'm really delighted that you took the time out to talk about your book. Um, Talk a little bit about Prisoners of Fear and I Am Kane, and also where people can contact you if you're interested and how they can get your book. Uh, well, uh, I Am Kane is is very much a topic right now uh, because it's the story of Nancy and Richard Langer uh, and their unborn child that were shot and killed uh, by a 16-year-old boy by the name of David Burrell. And uh, it was in Winnecke, Illinois in 1990. And what makes it unusual is, and making it timely is that in the last two years, the Supreme Court in Washington ruled that it's cruel and unusual punishment to take a 16-year-old child juvenile and put them in life in jail. And now David is up for parole at 45 wow. for the murders, and he's a sociopath. He murdered the young couple because he wanted to create 
a dossier as a hitman at 16. And uh, this is now becoming, I mean, I was on 48 Hours uh, two years ago. I was on Killer Kids. And this summer, the case is going to be coming up. And I'm going to have to testify before the Illinois Supreme Court because I'm the only one that has a psychiatric record on David Burrell. Uh, when he was, uh, when he tried to poison and kill his family uh, before the murder of Nancy and Richard Langer. So it's a story that gets into the mind of the killer, shows how a child uh, becomes more aggressive as they become a teen and how he becomes a killer. And a story that had so many twists and turns they thought it was uh, the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. They thought it was a oh. syndicate. They thought it was drug dealing. Nobody ever thought that it would be a 16-year-old boy from a well-to-do family that would have oh. killed it. And Prisoners of Fear is a very unique book about Connie Cheney, Winnie, Connie and Wayne Cheney, who was stalked and killed by her husband, Wayne. And it is told by the people who are dead because I got a hold of Wayne's diaries. Uh, because he kept extensive diaries, even when he killed Connie. And I got a hold of Connie's diaries. And I was able to take a look through the court system and through her diaries and his, and how the, someone is stalked and what they went through and how the laws were not there to protect them. And because of Connie Cheney, that the stalking laws became the stalking laws in Illinois because of her death. And what, what year so, was that? When did that take place? Uh, that was in 1993. Gotcha. And my, that book came out in 95. So I was going pretty good, 1990, 1992, and 1995. Gotcha. Uh, the books. I was to become the next Dan Rule. And, but I tell you, William, it's hard writing true crime books. Everyone thinks it. it's easy, but it's real. It's real real stuff it's not yeah. fiction right. and you have to get all the court records you got to get coroner reports you got to get the court trials and it's a hard thing to put that all together yeah it gets so to be very to another line of work good well it's probably better for your mental and spiritual health i can relate to you and i've done, written on some pretty brutal subjects so uh i mean i i can uh i can definitely sympathize uh where can people contact you if anybody's interested in uh Reaching out, do you have any social media or Twitter or Facebook or anything? Yeah, I've got, uh, I'm on uh, Facebook. I'm on Facebook, Geraldine Kolarik, K-O-L-A-R-I-K, and I'm on Messenger. So gotcha. that's how people contact me on Messenger, and uh, I'll contact them back. Great. And your first name is spelled G-E-R-A dash capital L-I-N-D, just for people. Geraldine right. Kolarik. Yeah, K-O-L-A-R-I-K. And uh, the books, I know you can buy them on Amazon. You can buy them on e-books. And you can buy them on audio books, too. Awesome. And so the ti- the, they're, they're out there. They're out there. Awesome. And the title of the book we talked about tonight is Free to Kill, the True Story of Serial Murderer Larry Eiler. Jera Lind Kolarik. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks okay. a lot, William. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, we're done. We're just... <laughs>